Hello, welcome everyone. Thanks so much for joining us for our second webinar. We got all your feedback. We're really excited this week. Please share your questions during the webinar. We're gonna try to stick to our schedule. We're gonna hand it over to Kam in a sec and he's gonna give us our content for the day. We have a really exciting visitor who is gonna share her story and we're gonna leave the 15 minutes in the end, uh, 1230 to 1245 to answer all your questions. So welcome, we're really excited to have you. Yes, welcome all, and um, really interested, really excited to, sh to share with you this chapter in the book, which really is, in my opinion, a very empowering chapter about how much of our of ourselves are self determined. How many things that we do on a day to day basis makes an impact on what we're going to be and who we're going to be in the future. Not all our genes are saying exactly, and really to. To highlight this, I want to I want to talk about two specific terms, and we're going to show these on the on the screen for you. One is is the genotype, and that is what you all know of as essentially your DNA. It's your hardwiring, and we want to dis differentiate that from what is actually what we express as the phenotype is what you are that you become when your genes are expressed. So meaning that just because you have a gene for a certain trait, for example, you have a gene for having blue eyes, that does not mean you're gonna develop blue eyes. There's so many factors that go into making you and expressing that gene in which you become. And our focus today is really on talking about all these individual factors and how Many of these things actually are in your own control, and actually the vast majority are in your control. And so, um, uh, so I want to bring up a couple of different diseases, and I want to ask you, you know, what do you think? I mean, if you had rheumatoid arthritis or one of these other conditions, scoliosis, if you had the the actual gene for these, you know, are are, are you are you destined to have this? Yeah, it's pretty scary, right? If someone told you they did a genetic study, uh, everyone's doing 23andMe these days, you see, oh my gosh, I have a genetic predisposition for heart disease or diabetes. You, yeah, I, I would naturally all of us get pretty scared. Yeah, and this is where I really want to you know, highlight how important it is that you realize how much environmental factors impact you developing those. For example, in these conditions like rheumatoid arthritis, it's an, it's an inflammatory condition. You think, my God, I'm gonna have this. It's gonna be progressive. But actually so many other factors like smoking and what you eat and the inflammatory factors, dust and environmental factors impact that disease. Scoliosis, if you are a daughter of someone with scoliosis and you have the gene for scoliosis, you're only going to develop scoliosis one third of the time. If you're a male who's the son of someone with scoliosis, it's only going to be one tenth of the time. Oh, wow. So there's so many other factors at play. And then because these are multiple genes that have to impact each other along with the environmental factors that, that we expose ourselves to. So the same thing with heart disease and diabetes. And interestingly, the same factors that will help in your back will also help your for factors such as heart disease and diabetes and cancer. Got it. So once you think about this, like this diagram, environmental factors are massively important and the genetic factors are only a small piece. And in a lot of studies, it's only about five to 10% of a lot of genes are determinative, meaning that the gene itself determines what's going to happen. 90% of factors are actually environmental overall. So let's go, let's dig into this a little bit deeper. So we're going to talk specifically about spine conditions and what you can do now, because again, being an individual means what? It means that our future is in our own hands. So these are the things you can do in spine conditions that can help you a lot is decreasing inflammation, stopping smoking and mechanical factors. And I'm going to spend a lot of time on the mechanical factors. There are other things too. In our future webinars, we're going to be discussing a lot of those other factors. But 
Today, I want to highlight some of these mechanical factors, but don't forget the inflammation, which is a lot of it's diet-related, eating foods that are high in the antioxidant content. Smoking is a huge no-no in, in the spine in multiple different uh, uh, ways, and, it, and it's a lot of blood supply and all the toxins that are in it. But I want to dig really deep today into the mechanical factors and, and really give you very actionable things that you can do on a day-to-day -day basis. So we talked about this in our first introductory webinar about, about sitting posture. And one of the most important factors in sitting is that what happens to the disc is that in a sitting posture, if you keep it for a long time, you're essentially squeezing out the fluid content of that disc. Think of your disc as a sponge. And every day think you don't want that sponge to be so compressed and squeezed that there's nothing in it that it cannot be a shock absorber, right? So what you want to do is constantly be moving that spine. But most importantly, you don't want to keep that C posture. You want to have your back position in a way where that normal curvature is there. And that's what, that's what will be protected. So um, let's go to the next slide. And before we, we go through some of these postures, I want to show these on, on you just to show you exactly what we mean by the sitting posture. So let's go back to the camera. And I'm going to bring a stool in here just to see, to, just to show and describe on you um, what happens with your sitting posture. So if you could take a seat here, and I want to show you with your back to the to the audience and to our listeners. So in a normal sitting posture, if you're on a, on a, on a stool, you can actually very easily sit in two different postures. One is kind of in that C posture. Imagine as time goes on, this is what you want to avoid. You want to try to keep your back in a straight or more lordotic posture, meaning like more curvature to have that sway back. But you see how much muscle tension, you have a lot of muscle tension in your back holding yourself there. Not easy, my natural tendency is to, to go down. Right. So one of the things you can do to make that better is get a wedge and essentially put it back in between lowering your back. Now sit on that. Now see how that feels. It's easier to now keep that curve. Right. Now you're not having to move much, right? So what has happened is this wedge has pushed the pelvis, essentially rotated the pelvis forward, so it naturally keeps that curvature in the low back. So uh, and that feel better? Do you yeah. feel like you can sustain that a long time? Uh, you know, before when I had to do it, I was firing pretty intensely. Now this feels more naturally. I can sit here and, and have a, that curve. So yeah, much easier. Very good, very good. So let's go back and talk about some other sitting postures. <clears throat> okay, so let's go back there. So important in sitting too is how you sit. They've done studies of the amount of pressure that your discs see in different positions. So in standing is actually a relatively good posture. And because you have that normal curvature of your back, it's actually, let's call that up. That's your baseline. That's your 100%. The middle slide there with that person sitting forward, what do you think? Does that person, is there discs? seeing more or less pressure. If they're forward with their, with their elbows kind of on their, uh, resting on their, on their hips, what do you think? Is that more or less? And how much more or less pressure on the disc? Well, sadly, I know I do this a lot. <laughs> and I know the answer is not good, so. <laughs> what do you think? I would say potentially 30, 40% more. More pressure. Yeah, but actually look at this. It's actually, the next slide. yeah is actually almost twice as much pressure is on your disc in that CD forward posture. That's an incredible amount. So imagine as you're sitting in your computer and you're working and you keep kind of gradually pending yourself forward or you don't even realize what you're doing sometimes you let that C posture eat, kind of seep in. This is why we tell people to constantly be moving around to reset. Constantly reset and think of doubling the pressure on that sponge every time you sit down in that position. So you're basically saying, I have bad posture, I do something that really is strenuous on my disc, it's okay, it'll withstand that, but like a sponge, get up, put some nutrients back in it, put some hydration back in it. Exactly, and then look what happens. 
When you lean back, what do you think occurs there? Look at this. You can actually, when you lean back 20 to 30 degrees from that seated forward posture, you actually decrease the stress to where it's almost like standing. So this is why it's important, even when you're driving, you know, sit, get the, your back not to be fully upright. Push it back about 5, 10 degrees. That's all you need. That's going to decrease the pressure quite a bit. Subtle degrees of motion make a significant impact on the disc pressure. Exactly. Huge differences. So now looking at these different postures, here's a bunch of different postures next to each other. So you'll see the difference in the disc pressure. So from the standing posture being 100%, you see how when you bend backwards like we had there at 110 degrees, it's about the same as standing. But look at the difference, interestingly, between the third and the fourth diagrams. You have on the fourth one, the person sitting upright at 90. And everybody tells you, you know what, sit upright, sit straight. But in a way, look at how much of a difference that 10 degrees makes. It takes you from four, almost 50% more strain on your disc to almost normal, maybe 20% more. So that's a huge difference. Imagine this day in, day out, the impact on your life. If you kept doing this and you have an eight hour a day, 10 hour a day job, it makes a huge difference. So it's this cumulative micro trauma. You keep on ignoring. Everyone feels this. Oh, I just reached for that piece of paper and it just went out. Well, it's actually years and years of not understanding how much you've been traumatizing. Exactly. Exactly. So then the other thing that to remember is where your arms are. This is why the ergonomic position of your desk is so important. If you see by having your hands at your side in a relaxed position, Look at how much your disc pressure is compared to standing. That's the second column. But then look what happens when you just rest your hand either on your armchair or, or in your lap. You take that, that, that pressure off the spine and look how much it decreases. So that makes a massive difference if you can unweight the spine. And we've done this all the time, right? When you sit down, every once in a while you have an armrest, just kind of push up on your armrest a little bit. It makes a big, big difference in the amount of strain that your discs are going to see. So how about other postures? Now, if you look at the best posture for your back, it's with your, with your line on your back, with your hips bent. So you see, if you, are in a, if you have about a severe back pain, that's your position right there. That's what you want to do. That decreases the amount of strain on your muscles and your discs. Lying down flat is still better than standing but look at what happens in that third posture sorry the fourth posture you're bending forward a little bit this is the posture you have when you're washing dishes or brushing your teeth. we do this all the time right it's right? very common but guess what this is this starts to squeeze the fluid out of the sponge of your disc and other activities you do can do it even more like weight, lifting weights in front of you or sitting lifting weights in front of you all of these factors make a big impact on the amount of pressure and they dehydrate your disc. Now, I'm not putting all this up here to frighten you to doing these things and, oh my God, I can never do these positions. That's not the point here. Is that think of this as this sponge that you wake up with in the morning and it's going through this process. You want that sponge to be dynamically hydrating and dehydrating throughout the day not over dehydrating and not over hydrating. So if I sit for 10 hours a day, if I fly and I have to take 12 hour flights or if I'm in construction, you're telling me I just need to periodically change it up, rehydrate, and that's the key. That's it, that's the key. So, and you look at this hydration dehydration cycle, what I really want you guys to focus daily on, on, on what you do, for example, if you are doing a heavy labor job, you can do it, but every two hours, take a 10 minute break, lie down, rehydrate your disc. Very, very important. If you keep doing that during the day, that's simple, fine. Simple message, fine. very impactful. If you're sitting for too long, same thing. Unweight your spine every once in a while, two, every two hours you're gonna be fine. In the morning, when you wake up in the morning, your disc is overhydrated. Don't immediately go exercise. Key. Wait, let about a half hour go by. The disc will collapse and, and settle a little bit. That's the best time, right? So, and, and 
And last thing is about your neck. Neck is the same way as the low back. Remember that your head has weighs about 12 pounds in a normal neutral posture. But look how much it increases when you bend forward. It's 60 degrees. Your, your poor neck is tolerating 60 pounds of pressure and those discs are sitting. Big, big difference. That's fantastic. So key messages there and, and really on how to unload the spine, rehydrate the spine. We're at 15 minutes. Uh, very excited to now have our guest come and uh, share her story. Please welcome everyone. This is Heidi. Thanks for coming today. Thank you so much for having me. Really appreciate the opportunity to be with you all. Uh, this is a story of hope and it's a story of what your amazing body is capable of achieving if you uh, give it the right things to work with, especially when you have those bad days and it's hard to stay compliant. Uh, I hope that you'll hang in there and give it your all because it's worth it. And so I'll back us up uh, over three years ago. Yeah, I want to give you a little oh, yeah. overview about like, <laughs> like this. Heidi, Heidi is an amazing, so really, really thank you for coming and, and sharing your story with us. Heidi, Heidi's story is one of uh, uh, amazing transformation from a large disc herniation, wanting, you know, eventually being desperate and needing surgery, to then at the end being able to actually take control of that whole process. So, so tell us your story from. Right, you know, and all the twists and turns that we're in there. Thank you. Yeah, so uh, back in January of 2015, I was out for a run. I had a very stressful job, so I went on several mall runs all the time. Took a misstep, uh, felt jarring pain across my hips and kind of limped my way home. I saw the chiropractor about every other day for about three weeks, and uh, eventually the pain got a little bit more tolerable and you know continued to do yoga stretching chiropractor um went and got uh with an orthopedic surgeon a ct scan an mri x-ray um couldn't find anything wrong in my hips we thought it was just inflammation from a childhood surgery so as life went on over the next two years i dramatically reduced my activity because everything hurt so instead of running and walking, I was swimming. There was so little that I could do when I was in the gym. Um, I felt really frustrated that I couldn't be as active as I wanted to be. I used to do winter sports and play golf. And of course, you know, I felt more and more limited. And it just seemed like every time I drew back, I would still end up even in more pain. And it just didn't make any sense to me. And then, you know, it started to happen to me was that uh, my job changed. And so my own behavioral factors really started to accelerate my decline. And so wearing high heels all the time, um, sitting for you know two, three, four, I mean, I think a few times I didn't even move from my desk for five or more hours. And you know, also standing, running through airports, um, trying to work on my laptop, you know, crunched up in a plane, um, you know, everything you can think of that was terrible for my posture, um, not knowing what was wrong with me. And then I started to not sleep at night because of the incredible amount of pain. So I wasn't regenerating. Um, I was so full of anxiety and fear. I was on a business trip. Uh, in September of 2018. So you can imagine just how long all of this went on where I'd be in and out of the chiropractor. And, um, you know, it just seemed to kind of cycle and repeat no matter how many times I went in, it would get better and get worse. And I reached into the overhead compartment when I was on this business trip to get my um, suitcase and my arm gave out and the suitcase fell on my head and I couldn't even move my right arm after that. And then things just really got bad from there. My legs um, and feet started going numb. Um, I was filled with a lot of anxiety and fear. I started having panic attacks. I was afraid that when I was driving, maybe my feet would not respond um, or you know, what's gonna happen if I can't get myself dressed when I'm on a trip traveling alone. Um, or what if I'm in so much pain, uh, I can't make it, you know, to work and I'm, you know, alone in a city somewhere. Um, so all of that was really starting to weigh heavily on me because I just didn't know what was wrong with me. 
And so um, I decided that it was time to really dig in and, you know, launch an investigation into what was going on. And I found a really great primary care doctor at Scripps. And it was through Scripps that I was finally able to get an MRI after having been denied from my carrier. And, you know, not all insurance and medical providers are created equal. Um, they have different things that they prescribe and have access to and different, uh, you know, philosophies on what's going to get people well. And I'm so fortunate when we finally did get the MRI results back uh, that I was with the right provider. And I'll show you what we found in that MRI and then I'll tell you more about what was the right treatment plan for me. Yeah, so let's switch to her to Heidi's MRI scan, and um, it's pretty remarkable the size of disc herniation she had. I mean, if you look at, um, and I'm hoping this arrow shows for everybody, normal discs have this white inner fluid filled, like we talked about. This is the water inside your sponge. But look at what happened to this disc. It's got, it's squeezed out into the canal. This is where the nerves run. And so this, th these nerves are being crushed by this very, very large disc herniation in the canal. And this is a cross-section view showing that this piece right here is the piece that's stuck inside the canal. The canal should usually be at least two to three times its size, and it's been compressed by this massive disc herniation. This is, this is an incredible story. So this is not an uncommon story that we hear a lot and and Heidi tell us from here you had your life every aspect of your life affected emotionally professionally we switch on back over yeah so um i made a personal decision for me that i felt like it was important i go all in on my health um, I decided to uh, leave work. Um, disability insurance is something that's available um, that we all pay in through our taxes. Uh, I decided that you know my full-time job for uh, the foreseeable future was to be well and to work with my care and provider team to do so. Uh, so I collaborated with my doctor at Scripps who understood the severity of my condition and just how long I had been in pain and, and essentially how my nerves had been conditioned to be in severe pain after such a long time. And so I got a referral from Scripps over to Spine Zone. I was seen in four days. So it was like a Friday and I was in on Tuesday and I met with the head of the center, uh, Tiffany at Vista. And um, she was fantastic in the intake. She understood how worried I was to get on weight machines when I hadn't been weightlifting or doing anything weight bearing for years because of the incredible pain. Um, so she was able to assess where I was currently, uh, provide me at home exercises that weren't intimidating, uh, guide me very gently through very low weight exercises uh, on these specialty high quality medical machines. And through that process, um, within several weeks, instead of being at five, six, seven, eight levels of pain every single day, all day, and worst upon waking, I was starting to see those levels come down more predictably towards fours and fives. But if you can imagine, uh, as you know, I was reflecting on all of this, I just didn't know that I was going to make enough progress. And I thought I should probably get some doctors to weigh in on, you know, is surgery going to be the only thing that gets me back to work? Because I'm doing nothing that aggravates my condition now. I'm not sitting for periods of time. I know, I know what's wrong with that now. Um, you know, I've been told why my posture is making such a big difference. I'm not, you know, standing for long periods of time. I'm not bending over in the wrong positions awkwardly, getting the laundry out, you know. And so uh, as we began to look at all of those factors, I decided to talk to two different doctors because I said, you know, I would like to believe that I can return to work someday. These were surgeons, right? Surgeons, thank you. <laughs> um, these were two different surgeons and each surgeon recommended a different kind of surgery for medically valid reasons as far as I could tell. And what that made me and my family feel was that um, we just didn't have the confidence that, you know, there wasn't going to be scar tissue and inflammation and 
um, whether or not it was the right surgery. And so we said, we've got to have a tiebreaker. So I requested through Spine Zone an extra consult uh, with Dr. Razaday. And uh, my family had a lot of trust in him already uh, because he had weighed in on my dad's case and actually not recommended surgery. So we felt if there was one person in the world uh, that might uh, tell me that, you know, I could do this on my own, um, maybe it would be Dr. Razaday. And so we, my husband and I met with him and uh, he felt like it was safe enough for me to continue on my current path. We decided that at the end of 12 weeks of working uh, with my spine zone um, consultant that uh, I would get a new MRI and uh, my insurance company did approve that. And so in the, and we committed to a plan that included a lot of things. So, traction. Yeah. yeah other things. So Dr. Razaday mentioned traction, which I really wasn't aware of. And we did 10 sessions of traction. Um, I did keep on with acupuncture, which I felt was helpful. Um, after the, the mass of swelling had reduced somewhat in my back, um, I did do a little bit of cupping. I took 30, uh, 3,000 milligrams of fish oils a day. I dramatically changed my diet. I stopped drinking um, any coffee or caffeine. Um, I wanted to do everything that I could do to increase hydration in my body, make sure that I was sleeping at night. Um, being out of a pattern of sleep because of the incredible pain meant that I had to relearn basic habits and kind of rebuild my life so that I could take my life back, wake up at certain times, go to sleep. I literally kept a tracker. Um, I will show this to you. Um, so uh, this is everything that I did in a day. And then these are the items that I checked off. And I'm not a perfect patient and I wasn't fully compliant. And you'll read in the book that this is a good method to follow. It's where I learned this method. And it's what helped me to understand that I don't have to be perfect to make progress. But pro like being compliant is hard. So you, you have to have a way to hold yourself accountable and look back and say, did I really do my stretches twice today? I feel like I just did them. Oh my gosh, I haven't done them yet. And- I mean, uh, how'd you yeah. change your mindset? You mentioned yeah. you were Thank having you. a lot of anxiety and you did an incredible job. How'd you do Thank that? Thank you. There's, there's really a mind body connection that goes on here. And, uh, I, you know, you can use therapy. Um, for me, I chose meditation and I wanted to make mindfulness and meditation a big part of my day because also being in touch with my body, um, you know, and, you know, making sure that I'm listening to myself and, and my own needs as well was a big part of this. And uh, so ultimately we decided that I would bet on myself that I could do this and that I could be compliant and that I could, you know, push myself through the spine zone exercises. I give spine zone and what I did in physical therapy, the vast majority of the credit, all of those other things were important. They're critical to, you know, feed into the system of what worked well. Um, I'm so grateful to uh, Tiffany and Lily and Byron and my entire team at Spine Zone who remembered to greet me by name and encourage me. And I would see the signs around that said, you know, you can live a life without pain and learn to trust yourself. And as I did the exercises, I began to feel strength in my body. Instead of feeling like my rib cage was collapsing in uh, during a walk, I would feel like I could stand up and lift up my body. And, and I felt like I really took back years of my life that I had lost in pain and in discomfort. And um, you have a lot. Of, I mean, you, yeah, you, you have you. a lot to congratulate <laughs> yourself for. I mean, you, know, you should thank take. You. you should take all. You should take the majority of the credit. Majority goes to Heidi. Thank yeah, you. but look, but look at look at the result. I mean, let's look at her MRI scan post um, post uh, treatment. And this took how long until you got to this stage where this you is felt like twelve you, weeks from the first MRI. So eleven weeks of um, two mostly two times a week we, we played with three times it was a little intense for the soft tissue but now i'm up to three times a week yeah and so look at this massive difference i mean this is dramatic you see how the disc herniation has really shrunken to only a few millimeters and from this large disc herniation that you see there to the small bump that you see thereafter look at the size of the spinal canal after it's really 
um, it's more than doubled as far as the spi uh, uh, space for the canal. And look at her nerve roots. Those are those little dots within the white. Those nerve roots are now free. They're able to traverse very, very freely in there. So big, big difference. Now, as you see, the disc doesn't go 100% back to normal, Heidi. What do, you, what do you do now to keep yourself continually on a good regimen? So at this point, I was told uh, by the surgeon at Scripps, the orthopedic surgeon, that I was no longer in danger of having cauda equina, um, which obviously would have been a huge... Can you describe that? For uh, you, what that yeah, is for so cauda like? equina can mean that we've fully crushed the nerve or nerve root, depending on where it occurs. It can mean that you lose the um, you, ability you to uh, move your limbs. Uh, it can mean uh, perhaps you're feet stop responding. Um, it can mean all kinds of other things that you don't want to think about. Bowel and bladder incontinence. Yes, thank you. Yes. Say that. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, so fortunately, you, you know, and then, but you have to keep doing this, right? It's not, it's not hundred percent. Right. Doesn't right. Immediately. I did 20 uh, sessions uh, in that time up, leading up to the second MRI that you just saw, which looks much better. And at this point um, I have done uh, almost uh, 40 sessions of maintenance um, afterwards. And so I do two to three times a week. I've also started alternating in yoga. It's very, very mild yoga. It's critical that you not try to go into um, certain classes where they're not uh, conscious of posture. Um, so very slow flow would be good um, or just stretching classes. And those things, yeah, and in watching your posture to daily, and things like watching that. my posture, not wearing high heels. Um, you know, I do lots of walking as well. Yeah. Several so, times a day. so this is terrific. I mean, Heidi is, it's a phenomenal how well you've done. And we want to really next, if you don't mind, take some, some questions from our audience and our listeners. Pulling it up right now. Um, I'm going to collate all the questions. You guys keep on. Okay. Chat. So, so uh, you say that, uh, one of the things factors is sitting. Now you do sit, you used to sit a lot. And now what have you done as far as your sitting and your posture differences there? So I have my wedge and uh, I know that I can push up on my handles and just give my seat a little wiggle, get a little sassy. <laughs> and, uh, you know, uh, making sure that, uh, not right this moment because we switch chairs, but generally, you know, making sure that my knees are at the 90 degree angle, my feet are able to touch. Um, keeping track of those things as well when I'm exercising, uh, those things are all important. And you're active daily, right? You have you have a regimen every week where you have a certain amount of exercise mm -hmm. that you do. Walking, yoga, um, and uh, there, there's a, a variety of mellow, you know, swimming. Uh, I'm still not running, uh, and that's fine. And it's probably not something I intend to do at this point. Can you, did you, uh, do you, are you very careful about how you bend over to either pick up things or brush your teeth or wash dishes or do anything like exactly. that? Exactly. So I could at any time put myself into a place where I'm in a ton of pain if I do the wrong thing. Um, but if I move slowly and believe me, it took me a while of moving slowly correctly so that now I can move a little more quickly correctly. So, uh, you know, over time and, and with awareness, you know, remembering to shine my heart, you know, because this helps to also bring your shoulders out, helps to lift you up. Um, so those things matter when I'm reading a book, you know, I'm not like this. I'm, I'm up here with the book. So those things matter. Yeah. So as a, sur as a surgeon, you know, looking at the other option, when I see her, it's it really, you know, even though... I've spent 20 some odd years doing surgery and, and, and have had results where after surgery, people go, man, you're great. My, my pain's better. I look at you and I think, man, this is even better because you have no scar in there. You know, I didn't do a fusion, for example. I didn't stiffen up that segment. I'm sure one of the two options you had, one was probably a discectomy, just take out the disc mm -hmm. fragment. One was do a fusion. Mm -hmm. If you did a fusion, that would mean that that would have been stuck. And that would would have put more pressure on the levels above and below. Right. So three years, five years later, the chance of you having more degeneration and problems is high. And another surgery. <laughs> so I look at this and I go, man, this is a wonderful fix. It's even better. If we can get someone like you, that's a better option than doing the surgery. So we have the first <clears throat> question from Catherine. How many days a week do you work out at Spine Zone and how much time at home? 
and the AM and PM? So I do three times a week now at SpineZone, and I worked my way up to that, which is important. You don't want to put too much pressure on the soft tissue. I worked with my doctor team to understand what was ideal for me in my case. And then I also work out nearly daily at the gym, and that is either a 50-minute yoga class or 45 minutes of cardio. And then I have stretches that I do. Uh, the spine zone takes about 25 minutes to do the three times a week. And then uh, the, the stretches themselves, which I've elaborated upon them a bit just to make uh, them more robust for me, um, those can take 12 to 20 minutes max. And But if I just do the spine zone prescribed ones, I can do them in 10. Good. Great, great. Another question from Linda. I've had a spinal fusion, L4-5, and I want to avoid adjacent level segmental disease. How can you help me? Terrific. I mean, this is very apropos because this is the L4-5 yeah. condition that she has. And I think uh, the, the key factors are mainly mechanical in this in, in, to avoid other adjacent disc problems. So if you can think of this sponge on a day-to-day -day basis, you know, wake up in the morning, make sure the first you know, the first half an hour, you, 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 you let, let things kind of settle a little bit before you do any kind of quick maneuver stretch. Like, a, you know, don't, don't stretch all of a sudden, don't go and all of a sudden empty, for example, empty out the garage, empty out the garbage or do something like that to hurt yourself. And then if you watch with proper sitting and standing techniques, you're going to avoid that adjacent disc problem, but it's a lifetime commitment. I mean, it's something where you can't just think, I can do it just one time. You've it, this is all cumulative, and don't be afraid to do that. Be active, but if you watch these postures and you avoid that C posture in everything you do, whether it be bending, sitting, and ah, think of this hydration, your chances of adjacent disc disease goes way, way down. So it's even more attention because you have this rigid segment in the middle. Great. Uh, another question from Eric. How many millimeters uh, was your disc herniated? I think you shared that on MR if you want to. Oh, yeah. I mean, you know, I, I didn't measure it uh, now. I, if I remember, it's close to. It was, it was 10 to 15, depending on the point at which you measured it. And then the second one was eight millimeters at its greatest point. Uh, eight millimeters is this width. And so what happens oh. is that, so, so the, the, the way you describe a disc herniation is this width and the amount that it pushes back in the canal. So, the amount that she had pushing back in her canal was at least 15 millimeters. And that was very, very significant. Now in her most recent one, it's like three to five millimeters. So, but it is still broad based. So what happens is that disc, the outer layer of it tore her, right? And so that's what caused that big, the, the, the big kind of broad based disc herniation occur, but the whole three thing shrunk down. So not only the width of it shrunk down to about eight, but the displacement in the canal shrunk also. And we know we know acute discs over time. Can you share a little bit about acute disc herniations? Obviously, for Heidi, this is a chronic issue. Tell me a little bit, of, you know, about our natural ability. Just if I do nothing, what percent of discs get better? Yeah, they've done studies of this before before surgery was available. And in fact, uh, what happens is that for sciatica, 60, 80 percent of patients who develop very severe back pain and leg pain with a large disc herniation their symptoms resolve within three months. So three months is that That's magic time, time period. If you can make it and you were, and I remember I talked to you around six weeks in and you were a little discouraged. Yeah. And that's the time where you have to, you know, be, give it a little bit more time because the body does, as long as you're improving. What I was very encouraged to see when I talked to you at six weeks, you were still making progress. You yeah. were, you were, you're not there. You were still discouraged, but you were, you're were like, you know, but I, I'm better than I was when I started. So that gave us that little opening saying, you know, let's keep going on this pathway. Now they've done studies before surgery was available and two years out, if you can wait long enough and do nothing, the disc herniations actually did as well in, in those studies as if you did surgery. That's so if remarkable. You did, so you took, took the whole disc out yep. on one group and the other group, you did nothing. Two years out, you got an MRI scan, they look the same. So really, this is, piece of this is again, your body's individual, right? Yeah. You're an individual. You're incredibly able to take care of these things on your own. So if you give it the right impetus, the right signals, your body can respond. Great. Next question, next question from David. With disc issues, what's the best form posture to pick something up from the floor, from the standing position? Beautiful question. <laughs> so so uh, I'm going to move you over just maybe. a little bit. 
Okay. So, okay, so so you want to lift something from the ground. So I'm sorry, I'm going to stand up a little bit here. So if, if you look at me from the side, right, if I bend forward and I'm going to lift something from the ground, right, the worst thing I could do is start bending my back in a C posture like this to bend it, to pick it up. What you want to do is, and also it's bad if I go over to the side to bend it, to pick it up. You're fine. <laughs> what I want to do is I want to be able to keep my back straight like this and use my glute muscles and pick up like this. Or if you can't do that, a lot of times you see how golfers lift, they uh, pick up the ball from the ground. They do, this is called a golfer's lift. Mm -hmm. And you just essentially, you hold, they have their hand on their golf uh, club and they use this balance here. This is a great way to lift things off the floor. So either use your hips, anchor yourself. Anchoring is huge. Anchoring is unbelievable. Take the pressure off. Take the pressure off, right? You take the pressure. Anytime you're doing something, if you take the pressure off, it's so much easier. Your body's not seeing that that big fulcrum, mm -hmm. and your muscles aren't trying to hold your whole trunk up. Can you share with us also, whenever you're doing any movements, to keep, again, that, for me, what I think of every day doing my activities is keeping that C posture or that, that normal curvature. I think that, to me, has made a big difference with my leg pain for years. Simple, simple activities. So no matter what, even bending down a couple degrees is critical. Oh, and not just that, getting up out of the chair. So let's say I want to get up out of this chair. If I'm getting up out of a chair, most people when they get out of a chair, they just kind of force it up, right? You you curve your back and you get up like this. That is not a good way to get out of a chair. The best way to get out of a chair is pull your legs in, keep your back straight, use your glutes, and look, lift yourself right up with your glutes, right? Your legs have to be underneath you to be able to do that. But if you can do that and use your glutes, you're gonna have a much less amount of stress transmission to your discs. Great, thank you. Uh, next question from Eric. Can disc herniations in L1 through five contribute to upper back pain? Yes, yes, good question, Eric. And um, <clears throat> your spine is, think of it as a bunch of links of a chain, right? And so what happens is that if you do affect one part of that link and chain, you're gonna affect the other portion. So, a lumbar disc herniation, a lot of ways, what it can do is, if you have your low back and your discs are narrow, what it can do is it, it reduces your ability to stand up straight. So your body starts to bend forward. That puts a lot more pressure. There's more gravity pulling you forward. So what does your body try to do? It tries to either hyperextend in the thoracic spine, so all those muscles start working harder in your thoracic spine, trying to, to hold you up, trying to compensate yeah. for the fact that your discs are not working as well in your lumbar spine, and so they're pushing you forward. So this is why getting that flexibility in the lumbar spine is so important, and then working on the strength of your overall trunk is important to get that balance, because you can have thoracic, not only can you have thoracic pain, but you can have neck pain also with a lumbar condition. So basically, kinetic change, Tries to compensate. Great, great question. Thank you, Eric. Uh, question from Vicky. Any advice on how to improve one's gait? Good question. And also, now this is now you're getting into the dynamic stuff, which is very, 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 very good question. Also, because your muscles are so important, and we're going to get into muscles in future webinars a lot, and we're going to talk about gait, trunk strength, all those things, and how important those are. But just a Quick preview, one of the most important things in your gait is your gluteus medius. It's the muscle that holds essentially, so if I were to stand like this, these are the muscles like this, they hold my hip straight. So if I were to lift up one leg, right, this muscle here is stopping my pelvis from collapsing, stopping it from it doing like this. So when I walk, if I don't have good glutes, I'm doing this all the time. I'm exaggerating now, I'm doing, I'm. I'm exaggerating, but, but that's what happens. That puts a ton of torque on your back. Every time if you're walking, every time you do, you Any walk. A bit of weakness. Now, obviously that's exaggerated, but a little bit of weakness is constantly torquing that disc. Not just that. Let's say you have just one side of weakness. Right. Then you're always stressing one side, right? So those are the things, the most important thing to do with that kind of, you know, when we start with almost all of our patients, and you've probably done it mm -hmm. at the time, 
is the Monster Walk. Monster Walk. These, <laughs> right? are, these are great. It made a huge difference. Yeah, so the Monster Walk, you put an elastic band in between your legs and you walk like a monster, like this. You know, one, like so glute medius, abductors, that's the key. Uh, next question from Robert. <clears throat> My sciatica has resolved. Is there any reason to have repeat x-ray or MRI to document the presumed improvement in dishealth? Great question because I already had that, but is that necessary for everyone? That's a great question and, and, it, and the answer to it is no. Absolutely not. Now, the reason Heidi had it is, is like, Heidi's condition is both one of sciatic symptoms and back pain, right? She's got a big blown out central disc. So she had a lot of back pain too. And, and we wanted to see her progress and, you know, and, and also to see whether she, you know, long term, if this is going the right direction, you know, we, we, surgery is not out of the question for everybody, right? Sometimes it's necessary. So if you have back pain that continues, you have a condition like this, and you have intermittent sciatic symptoms, you may need surgery, that's the time you want to look at it. But in someone whose sciatic symptoms have resolved, I would tell you no reason to get another scan. If your symptoms are better, that's all it's important. If, let's say, let's look at it two ways. Let's say you got the repeat scan and it showed a disc herniation. As a surgeon, I would never operate on you. I don't care. So in essence, if the MRI scan doesn't show, doesn't change what I'm going to do with you, why get another scan? Most important is clinically, how is she feeling? How's the patient feeling? And I see that a lot. A lot of yeah. patients will have the same finding and, you know, same, the disc hasn't changed, but their symptoms have improved. Right, right. Last question in the interest of time. Um, I have hip pain diagnosis, degenerative hip changes in the hips, uh, pubic symphysis, lumosacral junction. My doctor is recommending cortisone. How do you generally feel about cortisone injections? Uh, that's also a very good question. Cortisone injections come in many forms, right? They come in either, you can just get a cortisone shot in your buttocks, or you can get it selectively in certain joints, or you can get it around the nerves, called epidural injections. I think they're very helpful in a spout of severe sciatic pain that's not getting better. So if you have bad leg pain or bad arm pain, not getting better, you're doing the exercises, and you're hitting a plateau, you can't even do the exercises. You're stuck at home. That's the best time for an injection. Right. But there's other injections that are helpful sometimes. Facet joint injections. Those can help when you have pain with motion, just back pain with, or neck pain with motion. It, it, cortisone inje in other words, cortisone injections come in many different forms. You have to define what type of injection. It's not the cortisone that defines the injection. It's where it's placed. Yeah. Cortisone in itself is not necessarily unhealthy. It can be very helpful. Great. Well, thank you all very much. Thank you, Heidi. Thank I think you uh, we're really excited to have her spirit and her story be shared with everyone. A lot to learn. So thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks, so much. everyone. Thank you.